It is certainly not new. The transatlantic slave trade, forced labor, the inhumane treatment of black men, women, and children, and the eventual abolition of the slave trade. But what probably may be new to you is that the abolition of the slave trade in the early 19th century led to the creation of a new and even more sinister aspect of slavery, the slave breeding farms. The goal of these farms was simple, to produce more slaves to farm the land. How was this goal achieved? Join us as we unveil 10 facts about slave breeding that schools failed to teach you. Slave breeding for increased slave population. In 1808, the United States prohibited the importation of slaves from Africa. Despite this, in the antebellum South, where slavery was prevalent, the reproduction and life cycles of enslaved individuals were crucial concerns within plantation communities. Enslavers often likened enslaved people to livestock, such as cows, calves, horses, and pigs. In a demographic landscape where African men outnumbered African women, slave reproduction was understandably limited. Additionally, cultural practices from Africa, exceptionally extended breastfeeding, inhibited conception among black women. Combined with high infant mortality rates, this led to a significantly low rate of slave reproduction. Furthermore, the importation of Africans saw a higher mortality rate among women than men, resulting in a scarcity of women in local slave societies, with slave women unable to produce enough children to maintain, let alone increase, the slave population and plantation owners resorted to encouraging forced sexual relations. Moreover, the high death rate among slaves necessitated the replacement of losses, prompting owners to push for childbirth. Typically, enslaved women began childbearing around the age of 13, and by the age of 20, they were expected to have borne four or five children, slaves bred as commodities and wealth. Another of the 10 facts about slave breeding that schools failed to teach is that slaveholders actively encouraged their enslaved property to reproduce by cajoling, threatening, and coercing them into intimate relationships. Plantation owners saw enslaved women as a means of increasing their wealth and power, perpetuating the practice of forced breeding throughout the country. With little to no recovery from birthing, within six to 12 weeks, a slave could be pregnant again. To encourage childbearing, some population owners promised women slaves their freedom after they had produced 15 children. One slave trader from Virginia boasted that his successful breeding policies enabled him to sell 6,000 slave children a year. Enslavers then either sold or exploited the children born of these sexual relationships for labor, earning themselves a profit. In this way, enslaved women were both producers and reproducers of slavery, and these children also grew up to unwillingly follow in their parents' footsteps. Slaves' breeding farm promoted slave family orientation and protection. Slave families provided love and companionship, taught values, offered solace, imposed discipline, constructed histories, bestowed identities, and generally gave the enslaved a space in which they could assert themselves. However, by age five or six, most enslaved children had witnessed or even experienced family separation. It is clear that enslaved people did all they could to maintain their family units, and they often had to make difficult choices. Slave parents often raised their children to understand that their bodies were considered commodities despite their humanity. Most young girls approaching puberty knew that their bodies were the focus of financial calculations, negotiations, and under-the-table deals. Hence, enslaved women and girls used what little leverage they had to carve out a better place for their future children. Understanding these interactions shows the complexities of slavery and the savvy ways enslaved people desire freedom. Slaves breeding farm, slave marriage lawbreaker. A poor slave's wife can never be faithful, pure, or virtuous to her husband. She dare not refuse to be reduced to a state of adultery at the will of her master. If a master thought that a confident man and woman might have strong, healthy offspring, he forced them to have sexual relations, even though they were married to other slaves. If there seemed to be any slight reluctance on either of the unfortunate ones, the master would make them consummate this relationship in his presence. He used the same procedure if he thought a certain couple was not producing children fast enough. One of the 10 facts about slave breeding that schools failed to teach you was that slave marriages were not recognized by law and were not something that enslavers had to think about legally when disposing of slaves.
For example, the Louisiana Code of 1824 explicitly stated that a slave had no right to be married. Slaves served as domestic workers and concubines in breeding farms. Enslaved women were usually the property of the men who exploited them. Among the most complicated relationships during slavery were the intimate ones between enslaved women and their white enslavers. These relations ran the gamut from rape and sodomy to romance, from chance encounters to obsession, concubinage, and even marriage. It's hard to ignore the power dynamic involved, the often significant age gap, the sometimes incestuous connections, or the varying social status of all people involved in these connections. It's even challenging to find appropriate nouns to describe them. Enslaved women were counted on not only to do their house and fieldwork, but also to bear, nourish, and rear the children whom slaveholders sought to replenish their labor force continually. As house slaves, women were domestic servants, cooking, sewing, acting as maids, and rearing the planter's children. Later, they were used in many factories where they were kept at lower maintenance costs. Slave breeding farm, a life of resistance. Enslaved African Americans employed a range of tactics, both active and passive, to resist the constraints of slavery. Day-to-day -day resistance emerged as the most prevalent form of opposition, encompassing actions such as breaking tools, pretending illness, deliberately slowing down work, and engaging in arson and sabotage. These behaviors served as manifestations of slaves' disconnection from their masters. Running away constituted another method of resistance. Many slaves fled only short distances and did not aim for a permanent escape from slavery. Instead, they temporarily withheld their labor for economic negotiation and bargaining. Some fugitives sought permanent liberation from slavery, while the Underground Railroad to Free States. Often comes to mind, many runaways headed southward to urban areas or sought refuge in natural settings like swamps. Frequently, these escapees were relatively privileged slaves who had experience as riverboatmen or coachmen and possessed familiarity with the world beyond the plantation. Male slaves suffered buck-breaking violence. If there is one tool that was more brutal than whips and guns during slavery, it was rape, vicious and animalistic rape of enslaved Africans in America. Apart from women, men were raped. This act of buck-breaking or bot-bursting involves white enslavers and merchants raping an enslaved man in front of the public or the entire plantation to embarrass him and cause him to feel less of a man. This heinous act became popular when there were increased cases of slave rebellion. The men would first be stripped naked and whipped in the presence of a crowd, and after that, raped by the enslavers or merchants as a warning to other enslaved people. The targets were mainly the brave men, who were plantation leaders. To make matters more gruesome and unbearable, the enslavers make the African slave men with families have sex with each other in front of their families, or they were raped in the presence of their sons. Many of the men killed themselves or ran away after this. Slaves negotiated for liberty in breeding farms. No negotiation had higher stakes than when an enslaved person tried to buy themselves or their loved ones out of slavery. Unless an enslaver was desperately in need of money, power lay squarely on their side, and there was little an enslaved person could do to change the calculation. Several generations could spend their lives trying to purchase a release from bondage. After negotiating a price, the enslavers could have upped their price. The outcome of freedom deals rested on two exceedingly difficult things. First, their enslavers' promises, which were subject to changing self-interests and the optics of control they needed to display to others they enslaved. Second, those eyeing a way out of enslavement needed hefty sums of money, a huge hurdle. Hence, negotiations during slavery took on many forms. Sometimes they were successful the vast majority were not. Slave cultures were disrupted in breeding farms. The institution of slavery usually tried to deny its victims their native cultural identity. Torn out of their cultural milieus, they were expected to abandon their heritage and to adopt at least part of their enslaver's culture. Nonetheless, studies have shown that there were aspects of slave culture that differed from the master culture. Some of these have been interpreted as resistance to oppression, while other aspects were survivals of native culture in the new society. Nevertheless, relatively few African social practices or plastic arts survived. Afro-American music and dance are known to have many African roots, and they differed dramatically from the practices of the European master culture.
The use of drums and banjos was especially significant. Songs and spirituals borrowed their strong call and response patterns from the West African style. Slaves breeding as a form of children abuse. The last of the 10 facts about slave breeding that schools failed to teach you is the abuse against offspring of slaves fathered by white men, known as mulattoes, was a pervasive issue. Such children could never openly acknowledge their master as their father. It remained a mere whisper, one he never entertained as truth. He now had reasons to doubt its veracity. One might assume that these mixed-race children would receive preferential treatment from their masters compared to other enslaved people. However, the opposite was true. A man who would enslave his kin couldn't be relied upon to show compassion. The mulatto child's presence served as a constant reminder of the master's transgressions. Even more distressing was the perpetual offense such children posed to the master's wife. She detested their existence, and a slaveholding woman's disdain knew no bounds. And when white women expressed disapproval, the consequences for the victim were severe. Kicks, beatings, and lashes were inevitable. Masters often felt compelled to sell these children to appease their wives' sensibilities as an act of mercy, liberating the children from their merciless tormentors. Nevertheless, the harsh reality endured. Under the laws of slavery, children were always categorized by the status of their mothers. This system facilitated the appalling exploitation by cruel slaveholders and their morally bankrupt relatives, perpetuating sin for profit. Although slavery may no longer be a thriving topic, how many of these 10 facts about slave breeding have schools failed to teach you? It is essential to acknowledge the deep-seated racism and exploitation that underpin these practices and work towards dismantling systems of inequality and injustice that continue to affect black Americans. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe, and share to inform more people about the reality of black people. Thanks for watching.